Good evening, everyone. My name is John Taves, and I'm the event coordinator at McNally Robinson Booksellers here in Winnipeg. We're broadcasting tonight from Treaty One territory, the traditional territory of the Anishinaabeg, Cree, OG Cree, Dakota, and Dene peoples, and the homeland of the Métis Nation. We're delighted that you could all join us here this evening. Uh, we're here tonight for a very special virtual event to celebrate the publication of M.A. Craft's Treaty Words, as for as long as the rivers flow, published by Annick Press. This is a truly beautiful book, and I'm so pleased that you've all joined us here tonight to recognize its appearance in the world. Though I'm sorry that we cannot gather in person, I'm delighted that uh, people from across this continent and beyond are able to join this online party, heedless of geography. Uh, one person who sadly could not join us here this evening is the book's illustrator, Luke Swinson, the Anishinaabe illustrator whose beautiful work graces this book's pages. And I just wanted to take a moment to acknowledge his indelible contribution right out of the gate. We're also joined by another very special guest this evening, uh, M.A. Craft's niece, Lucy, who will be joining M.A. at the beginning of the event. We'll be hearing from both of them in just a moment. But I did want to mention right out of the gate that at and as we get to the close of the event, there will be an opportunity to ask questions of MA. So over the course of the evening, as questions occur to you, please just write them in the Q&A box. You'll find it right at the very bottom of the Zoom webinar screen. Rest assured, you will not interrupt the event when you ask a question. And as soon as we're finished the presentation portion of the event, I'll return and ask some of those questions of MA. MA Craft herself is an Anishinaabe Métis lawyer from Treaty One Territory in Manitoba. She is an associate professor at the Faculty of Common Law, the University of Ottawa, and a leading researcher on Indigenous laws, treaties, and water. She's also a prolific editor and author, and of course, an aunt. Please join me in welcoming M.A. Craft and her niece, Lucy. Thank you so much, John. Bonjour and dinner and It's great to be here tonight. Um, we're coming to you from Treaty One Territory. We're in Winnipeg, and I have with me here my niece Lucy, who uh, has graciously agreed to uh, do a reading from the book tonight. Um, we're we've we've been having fun and laughing so much tonight, so uh, we invite you to share in our our laughter and fun, uh, even though the the book has a bit of more of a serious tone. Um, it does talk about relationships and in all relationships, we should have laughter and we should have those moments of uh, warmth and uh, being able to laugh at ourselves, <laughs> enjoy ourselves. And I hope that's what you'll do tonight as we uh, spend this time together. So this uh, little book uh, deserves so many thank yous. Miigwech um, first to um, well, to all of the people who inspired it, all the people who listened to an original oral version of it, um, and those who feature as characters in it, uh, those who helped me understand through my lifetime the relationship of treaty, and also to uh, Katerina Vermette and Warren Cario for taking a chance on this story. It was first published in um, Prairie Fire uh, in a special edition that they edited and uh, they accepted this lonely little piece from someone who'd never written fiction in their life and uh, agreed to, uh, to publish it. And at a later point in time, Mary Beth Leatherdale uh, brought this book to Annick Press and contacted me and said, would you like to turn this into a children's book? And I admittedly said, I don't know that I know how to write a children's book. And she said, it's, it's really there already, your story is is there what's interesting is i had shared this with a friend and said you know i feel like this is the story of treaty that needs to be told so that all people can engage in thinking about what treaty is as a relationship and then to put that in action and understand that our treaties come to us not just as human arrangements but that they're built on uh, all of the things that we see in our environment and all of those relationships that we model ourselves after so this book um, is the story of a young girl and her Michelmas. And uh, they spend some time together and Lucy's gonna read you a passage from the beginning of the book that explains the nature of their relationship and the kind of things that they do together. So I'll hand it over to you, Lucy. 
She sat there on the bank of the Kitchi Sippy with her Mishomas, watching the wide river pass them by. This was their place. He had lived there all his life, watching his children and his grandchildren grow. Mishomas's house was small, but that didn't matter because most of his time was spent out on the land, in the bush, and when he could, on the mighty river. Even though she had grown up in the city, it was the small lot with banks <laughs> that clasped into the river that was the closest thing to home for her. In his lifetime, Mishomis had traveled that river many times, up and down, until the dams were built. Then the river changed. Even so, after the dams blocked his canoe, he continued to spend time on and with the river. It was his place, his relative. Throughout his life, he had helped research helped research the nameo, the sturgeon in the river, and restock the population. In his later years, he had led territorial mapping projects of original places, names in Mishinaboyan, recalling each place by its original name and significance. Every spring, while there was still snow on the ground, he would cash it in his pension check buy supplies and head into the bush. He'd only take oh, he'd take only a backpack, some flour, sugar, lard, and tea, and would come back out four to six weeks later, hitchhiking his way home. She would get a short call from him saying that he was back and she'd make her way up to visit him. On these these and other visits they sat, looking across and at the river, sometimes talking to each other, but more often sitting in silence, listening. The beauty of their silence was in them, in everything that they heard around them. Mishonis taught her how to hear, challenging her to understand each sound from the most pronounced bird calls to the subtle sound of tiny insects crawling around in the grass. Thank you, Lucy. You're welcome. And Lucy chose this passage um, as a very thoughtful um, gesture because she didn't want to spoil the story. She didn't want to read the end to you. She also didn't want to tell you too much about the story because she wants you to read the book. Is that right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, that's the, the teaser, the beginning, the introduction to the characters. And one of the things that the characters in the book do is they sit by the river and they make a fire and they have these conversations. And a lot of the story is taking place on a spring day. So you'll hear parts of um, descriptions of the water breaking up and the sun shining and the snow uh, on, the, on the ground and the geese coming home. And uh, <laughs> what's kind of fun is it's, it's, I've been rereading this book so many times lately and uh, it's exactly this time of year. It's based in this, this time of year. And uh, so it's a good reflection of, our environment and, and where we where we come from, where we've grown up and how we recognize those as the sounds of home, right? Yeah. Yep. Um, I wanted to read uh, in, in the spirit that Lucy introduced, which is not to give away the ending of the story or too much of the meat of the story. I wanted to share with you uh, the author's note. And so this is just a couple of pages where I was asked to explain the importance of the book. And this was actually a little bit challenging to write because um, I often write academic work, but I wanted to talk about the importance of this and, and why I think um, this is a great opportunity for everyone to engage in conversations about treaty. And my hope is that you'll read these books together to each other. This is why we decided to do uh, the, the book reading this way so that you can uh, share these ideas and then spend some time talking about them and uh, hopefully living them. So here is my author's note and my, my hope. Since I was a young girl, I've been taught to listen and observe. There's so much to learn from everything that's around us. 
It helps us better understand what's inside of us as human beings. When we truly listen, we can hear that creation has a way of being, what we sometimes call natural law. All beings have a part to play in making sure Mother Earth continues to thrive. There are unspoken and unwritten agreements between all parts of creation. Over time, our Anishinaabe ancestors modeled themselves on this natural law and formed customs that make us who we are and that help us to understand our place in creation. The story in this book reflects how natural law gives us an understanding of treaties or what I call agreements to make relationships that will allow us indigenous and settler to live well together in harmony in accordance with those laws. In particular, this story reminds us that our treaties are anchored in relationships based on respect, responsibility, and renewal. Respect for each other, ongoing responsibilities towards one another, and a constant renewal and affirmation of that relationship. What our ancestors promised was an equal and non-exploitative sharing of the land for the benefit of everyone, including all the other beings that belong to the land as well. The trees, the rocks, the water, the four-legged animals, the winged ones, the crawlers, the swimmers, everyone. Today, each of us must think about all of these relationships and how our actions will affect all of our relations. Treaties are not just words written on paper or empty promises. They're not contracts for the sale of land. They are the agreements by which our ancestors confirmed that we would share these lands without interference, but with respect for each other. Today, we need to better understand these values and renew these relationships, which build on all of the relationships that have existed for millennia between all parts of creation. These relationships help us understand our responsibilities in these territories we call home. So thank you for listening. Thank you for spending this time. We're happy to um, answer any questions. I do want to acknowledge the amazing artwork by Luke Swinson. This yellow tag is not Luke's. We'll take that. <laughs> uh, the amazing work by Luke Swinson, who uh, read this story and just captured it and enhanced it through, uh, through his work. And I did ask Lucy if she would take questions. And she said, yes, she's a very, very brave 10 year old. Um, and so if you have any questions for Lucy or myself, we're happy to uh, hear them. Perfect. And so I will thank you so much, uh, both of you, for that conversation about the book and to Lucy for your beautiful reading. Uh, we are going to move along to the Q&A period. So if anybody does have any questions, uh, you feel free to ask them either in the chat or the Q&A box, and I'll certainly convey them along. But I did want to uh, start off with a question of my own. Now, M.A., your first book, Breathing Life into the Stone Fort Treaty, which is published by UBC Press, also looked to the spirit and intent of the original treaties, but in a very different way. And I was hoping that you might like to speak to the link and natural development uh, between that book and treaty words, which I imagine closely follows the arc of your own career and development, too. Yeah, thanks for that question, John. Um, Breathing Life into the Stone Fort Treaty was, um, I would say, one of the best things that I've ever done in my life to try and put into words and explain how Anishinaabe uh, law influenced treaty making. But the book itself is weighty. It has, um, it's, you know, it, it dives into really complex concepts and it's not a book for every audience. And so I always thought about how do we translate this to others? How do we bring these concepts of reciprocity and relationship and renewal into broader conversations. And that's one of the things that I received as feedback from Breathing Life into the Stonefort Treaty was that this was knowledge that every person felt that they needed to have. Once they'd had a chance to read the book and engage with it, they said, why didn't I know this? I wanna know more. I wanna engage in these, these conversations and, and act in that relationship of sharing. Um, so, for many years, this 
story percolated and you know it's a, a deeper understanding of where the philosophy of treaty um, making comes from now don't get me wrong this is not a philosophy book right <laughs> if you go to McNally's you're not going to go to the philosophy section and pull this off the shelf but I actually do think that it, it is in many ways deep philosophy, it's governance, it's, um, you know, it's biology, it's all of those things because it's reflecting an Anishinaabe way of life and an understanding of how you make relationships, how you maintain relationships, what it is to ultimately be a, uh, Anishinaabe, which is to be a good person. Um, so I think that it is a very natural flow from uh, and one that I wouldn't have expected, but a very natural flow from some of the work uh, that comes through breathing life and now, um, you know, finds its its current resting place in for as long as the rivers flow. Now, this line for as long as the rivers flow is actually part of words that were pronounced in most of the treaty negotiations in Western Canada, Canada. Um, and the uh, the language was taken up by both sides. So the treaty commissioners and Indigenous parties to treaties. And the language, uh, there are some different philosophies on, on where it comes from. And a lot of people have pointed to the idea that it may be forever, it may mean forever, um, thinking about that as a concept or thinking about the British Empire's sun never setting. Um, you know, there's, there's a few different ways of thinking about it, but the concept that's introduced here is one that is a reflection um, I think of the teachings that I've had in my lifetime, which tell us that for as long as the sun shines, the grass grows and the rivers flow actually is meaning to intend that as long as creation is working in collaboration, as long as we see that reciprocity, as long as we understand that these different parts of a broad circle are in interaction and working together, and working together harmoniously, or trying to, anyway. Yeah, it's in the book. The line is in the book. <laughs> what page? Uh, the last one. Okay. Um, that, you know, if all of this continues to happen, then that's when we have a good life. That's when we're actually being, when we're part of creation, when creation is working well. And it doesn't say, you know, for as long as humans decide, because really, as humans, we don't have that much impact. We can have negative impacts, but in large part, these things are happening without us and we're very dependent on our natural environment. And so we look to these different parts of the environment, um, including the sun and the grass and the rivers to give us instructions. And that's really what is meant to be articulated here in this story. And we don't just talk about it. We actually see it play out in the book. Thank you very much for that. And uh, I'm going to very selfishly ask one more question of my own before turning it over to some of the lovely questions that we've already received from the audience, because it, it kind of builds from that, uh, both in Breathing Life into the Stone, Fort Treaty, and uh, in this book itself, you um, really convey the importance of speaking on behalf of and listening to the land. And I was wondering if you could speak uh, a little bit more about the importance of that and how you felt uh, how you conveyed that through the text itself or how you look to convey it? Mm. Well, when we think about how Indigenous laws are structured, um, they're very different than Western systems of law, which are generated in large part from human needs and human actions. Uh, if you look at Indigenous law, we're thinking a lot more in terms of customs that have developed over time, but that have been observed from a natural environment. And, um, you know, looking at how the land uh, and all of the different parts of creation that are the land, right? You can't have one without the other, uh, is an important way of thinking about what those sets of obligations and responsibilities are. Um, and so I always think, and we've always been told, right? When you're out on the land, you're looking at what's happening. You're looking and listening, hearing, you know, what are the animals? Oh, we should tell that story. Sensing. Right, yeah. you should tell the story. Like the other day we were walking by the, the walking on the riverbank and you went. <laughs> we were walking on the riverbank and we saw two baby otters playing in the river and we've never seen any otters there. And it just so happens that 
we whenever we're together on the river we see at least one otter otter <laughs> yeah and it was funny because we were we were kind of separate and i said did you hear that and lucy said yeah i heard that i think it's ducks there's <laughs> i said that is not a duck sound we need to investigate this and she has really good eyes and spotted these two little otters playing on the other side of the bank of the assiniboine river and it was it's very i've never seen an otter on the assiniboine river but it was nice because what we were doing was listening and we spent probably 15 minutes just watching them play and then go into the ice and they were being pushed by the ice and then they swam under. And what we were watching was their behavior in relation to their environment, this river that was breaking up, but also their um, behavior towards each other, their relationship towards each other. And I think they were laughing, right? Like. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think that we heard the otters laughing. And so much of that great joy at listening to the natural world is conveyed so strongly in this book, both through the words from the Mishomas and the realization of the granddaughter as she lies by the river. There's some really incredible and very beautiful writing about nature in this book. Uh, we've received a number of questions from a variety of people who are interested to know whether or not there are any plans to translate this book into any other languages, either other indigenous languages or into French. Uh, do you know any plans? I would love to see that happen. Um, I, I, I think that that would be important. Uh, the understanding of treaties is not um, unilingual. And I think that, you know, one of the things that I said in the author's note is that uh, treaties aren't just about written words on paper, right? So this is a starting point of discussion and I would love to um, have it translated. So I'm actively going to look into that and hopefully share more on that um, whenever I can. Uh, Nicole was wondering uh, what your inspiration was for this story and what was the process like developing and writing it? Uh, you said. <laughs> So there is this gathering in White Shell, White Shell that is called the Nibi Gathering, and it and their inspiration is water is life. So all of the work that I do is mostly re is related to water and understanding relationships with water. The inspiration from this story uh, for this story draws from a variety of different events, but one crystallizing event, no pun intended, was actually being by clear uh, lake up in uh, the northern part of Manitoba uh, and listening to the ice break up. So when I arrived at the beginning of the day, there was a full sheet of ice on the water. And then later in the day, I sat or I laid down in the warm sun and you'll see that the character in this book does that. And she listens to the sheets of ice break and the crystals of ice that fall into the water and the beautiful sound. And she, um, she sees this relationship between the sun that's warming the water and transforming this ice back into its water form. And um, what's, you know, what's interesting is that is a time of year that we uh, honor the water, right? So we'll do our ceremonies to acknowledge the water at this spring breakup time. And then uh, some do it also in the fall when the water is about to transform back into ice. So it's an excuse me. It's an acknowledgement of that cycle of uh, of life and the fact that water itself is uh, is life. And so you'll see um, that that part of the story is a reflection of an event that really inspired me to understand that when we made treaties, we had modeled them on these values that were demonstrated all around us in our natural environment. And that profound understanding of that phrase, you know, for as long as the sun shines, the grass grows and the rivers flow, became really clear to me in that, in that moment, it, it kind of stood out. Great. Thank you for that. Uh, we are getting a number of uh, personal reminiscences and uh, greetings in the Q&A box as well. So rest assured, while I won't be reading those out loud right now, I will be passing them along to MA and Lucy uh, afterwards. So everybody will see your words. There are some lovely stories coming in. 
uh, Brett and Jerry Hewson, who would certainly know quality picture books uh, or children's books in general, wanted to offer congratulations and mention that they were excited to take a dive into the book and really love the artwork. Uh, they would love to know if you would ever see um, the book as part of an on the land teaching resource. Uh, they mentioned that they would love to attend a camp in session where people can talk about the book and the teachings. Absolutely, I think that's a wonderful idea. Uh, I'd love to organize one with you, <laughs> with you guys. Um, I think the water gathering is an opportunity to do some of this. Um, it was interesting reading one review that actually said this book in the small format, because you can see it's kind of tiny, right? It's, it's a nice little size. Someone said, this is the kind of thing you can put in your cargo pant pocket while you go hike in the wilderness. And I thought, I'm not sure that this person actually does a lot of hiking because that's probably not what you would choose to put in your cargo pant pocket. But yeah, <laughs> <laughs> you put like a trail mix or something. Probably trail mix. Yeah. But, um, you know, I think the the intent there was was really important and that you know, there's, there are so many layers to this book. There are so many stories within stories. And the idea is that uh, when you read it, you can have moments where you have that interaction like we had about the otters, right? You can have those memories that come up or you can have those teachings and you build on the things that you know that you want to share. And um, yesterday I, I was, um, the University of Ottawa awarded me a, Emerging Researcher Award, and I was very grateful. Um, but one of the things that I said, you know, as I was receiving the award is um, everything that we are meant to do is actually about co-learning and intergenerational learning. So when I sit with Lucy, although I'm significantly <laughs> older than her, <laughs> I learn from Lucy, I think, as much as she learns from me, right? We have that relationship where we teach each other things. And we might not actually set out to teach each other things. Like I won't say, oh, Lucy, sit down. I want to teach you something. We'll just sit down and laugh. And it's not even about learning or teaching. It's creating those moments and those opportunities to, uh, to discover and to learn. And so I think what, um, what you're suggesting in terms of uh, land-based um, learning is, is an excellent idea. And I'd love to see some of Brett's books to uh, be part of that, uh, that on the land learning. And again, I would uh, mention that if anybody does have any further questions, please do feel free to get them in. I'm uh, personally always very curious about the process of putting together a book and was wondering if you could speak a little bit about working with Luke Swinson as the illustrator. Were you very involved in the back and forth conversation with him? We actually did this a little bit differently and, and I learned something. I think I would like to be more involved during the illustration process. So we had proofs back and forth and, and I think everybody's feeling that this year is uh, totally different year with the pandemic. So we didn't have an opportunity to see each other in person, but I did look at, um, at his work as it evolved. And um, in terms of, you know, sharing, um, sharing the inspiration for uh, the characters, I think Luke has said to me, and he said in, in some of his posts on Facebook that he was really touched by the story and maybe felt a little intimidated to try and put images to words. Uh, but I think he did a really beautiful job. Um, one of the things that I think I would do a little bit differently uh, if I had to do this again would be to uh, maybe sit in those the spaces that are described in the book with the illustrator. So in some ways, I wish I'd gone to the banks of the river and maybe had a conversation with Luke from that place and who knows what could have come up organically. And I think that's tying to the idea of land-based learning as, as being intimately connected to uh, the things that we can glean from books. I also have a great editor. My mom reads everything that I write and offers very uh, thoughtful, critical suggestions for improvement. And uh, uh, so that's always fun. She likes to work on paper with, you know, the circling and the, the notes. And, and so I always really enjoy that part of the, the process to getting her feedback. Uh, she does the, the details. And then my dad talks about the big ideas. They really <laughs> are, are always encouraging with us when we, any projects that we take on. Uh, there's a question for Lucy from Nicole. 
Uh, Nicole was wondering, Lucy, how many times have you read the book? Do you understand or notice different things every time you read it? I actually notice new things every time I read it. And I've probably read that thing 12 times. <laughs> I think that might be Nicole, my sixth grade teacher. Um, and uh, I, I do want to give her a shout out because she was a great, a wonderful teacher in sixth grade uh, and a very creative person. And I'm glad she asked Lucy that question because that just shows what kind of a wonderful teacher she is. And a lot of the co-learning um, philosophy and um, the creative um the creative approach that I have come from wonderful mentors and teachers that I've had throughout my lifetime. So I just, I wanted to acknowledge her. Well, you are entirely correct because one of the uh, slightly longer comments that I was going to send along and which I will make reference to quickly uh, was from Nicole. And she mentioned that you were in her first grade six class, uh, what a great class that was and what an exceptional student you were and how wonderful it's been to follow your career. Uh, she also wanted to mention uh, and offer uh, compliments to you, Lucy, as well, saying, bravo, Lucy, I teach students your age, and like Amy said, you are brave, you read beautifully, and you both make a great team. I see you every time. And uh, Heather was wondering if uh, you spoke any other languages, and uh, if you were planning to present on the book in multiple languages, French, for instance. Yeah, so I speak, um, well, Lucy and I both speak, read, write, uh, and joke in French and English, <laughs> and dream in French and English, probably. <laughs> uh, I'm a beginner in, in a shopping one. Uh, I try and, um, and learn, I try to learn one word a day, and I've been doing that since 2010. So uh, anyone who's good at math will know that I have a little bit of a vocabulary, uh, but you know, one of the things with an Anishinaabe one is that it's a verb-based language and it's a very descriptive language. So it's different. You can't just translate directly from English or French. Um, so in many ways, I'd love to have uh, an opportunity to sit with a fluent language speaker who could do an audio translation of this. And um, one of the projects I've worked on in the last few years is a Nibbe declaration, a water declaration, with the Women's Council in, in Treaty 3. And one of the things that we did was to issue um, a written declaration. Actually, I have a copy of it here. Oh, yeah. The book is tiny, the declaration is huge. <laughs> 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 um, and so we have the English written version of it, but we also have an audio interpretation in the Anishinaabe one that is um, equally authoritative. So both of those versions are the true versions of this declaration of, of then this commitment to Nibe or water from the Treaty 3 perspective. And, and I think that that's an important point to make in that, um, you know, these oral versions in Indigenous languages are, are very important because they're so descriptive and verb based and they tell us something different. So if I was to read that to you, it would take me about 15 minutes and the oral interpretation takes about 45. So that gives you a sense of, you know, how much richness is uh, in the Ojibwe language that, um, that you, you can't translate into an English or, or French text. I'm also taking Spanish lessons because I'm going to work in Colombia with some Indigenous people there on water relationships. And uh, we're going to do exchanges between some of the nations within this territory. Uh, Treaty 1, 3, and 5 with nations in Colombia. So, um, you know, it's, it's fun to work in, in different languages and hopefully one day I can get some help in putting this into uh, an Anishinaabe and Wind version. Thank you for that. Uh, Irene uh, says, during this difficult time, I think many of us are looking for a connection to our spiritual selves. And many of us have our own religious spiritual connections. How do you connect between treaty words and the spirituality of traditional religions? Oh, that's a big question, Irene. <laughs> I, have okay. I have a little answer. You have a little answer? Go for it. So what I do is that I just walk out into the forest, lay on my back, lay on my back and just kind of relax and let the forest talk to me. Yeah. 
The other day we went uh, for a walk, a uh, hike on a on the Broken Head uh, interpretive trail that goes through the uh, the swamp and, and bog near just north of Broken Head. And uh, one of the things we were talking about is actually talking to trees and rocks, which are animate beings from an Anishinaabe perspective. And so we spent some time talking to rocks and trees and have some fun photos of my nephew who um, <laughs> is telling us to be quiet <laughs> because he really wants to hear what's going on. And I think that that's, that's awesome. And each person finds you know, their connection to spirit in a variety of different ways and, and at different times in their life. One of the things that hasn't been taken away from us in this pandemic is our ability to be part of uh, creation. That will always be available to us because creation is the thing that we depend on. Um, so whatever that looks like on any given day, it may be like today looking out and seeing the the sun that was out today um, and being grateful for it yesterday. It was the snow <laughs> <laughs> on Sunday. It was the otters, you know, whatever it is that brings you that, um, that renewal and that deep understanding that um, there's life all around us. And, and like I said, you know, there's, everybody sees that in different ways. And uh, one of the best teachings I ever received, I can't, I guess you can't, say some are better than the other, but one that stood out and kind of had a, a profound impact on me is the teaching that everything that you do is ceremony. It doesn't have to be complicated. It doesn't have to be formalized. It can be just an acknowledgement of an, an expression of gratitude. And I do that every morning and it doesn't feel like a religious or spiritual thing, but I, I thank the water um, when I take my first glass of water uh, in the morning and I thank the people of Shoal Lake because I know that the water that we have in the city of Winnipeg comes from Shoal Lake and it's had pretty significant impact on the people um, and the environment of Shoal Lake to, for us to be able to take that water and have it as our source of clean drinking water. So to me, you know, those, those acts, um, what my friend and colleague um, Jeff Corntassel calls everyday acts of resistance um, are also everyday acts of celebration and, and ceremony. And I feel, think that those are really important for everyone. And they're especially important when you're facing a pandemic and, and the things that we've all been facing <laughs> for the last year. So we've received a number of questions from teachers in the uh, Q&A box. Uh, one of them was asking what advice you might have for educators uh, to assist in teaching children about reciprocity, uh, particularly children who may have more resources than others. One of the things that I have often done when I have spoken to young groups uh, with the Treaty Relations, Commission speak Treaty Relations Commission Speakers Bureau is to talk about um, substantive equality versus uh, formal equality and to use examples of that. You know, being exactly the same doesn't always mean that you're equal. And to think about other people's circumstances and they, how they come into uh, certain spaces and that doing everything in the same way is not necessarily always a good or favorable outcome. Uh, another thing that I like to think about in terms of um, understanding treaties as, as sharing relationships is the idea of um, living in the same house. And I love doing this exercise with younger students, like grade one students, because I tell them like, okay, we're going to move in, we're going to share our house. And we start with a very equal sharing. You get one bedroom, I get one bedroom, we share the kitchen, share the living room, share the one bathroom. <laughs> <laughs> okay, and then let's say Lucy decides all of a sudden one day that she wants to have full control of the kitchen and bathroom, that I'm totally excluded from the kitchen and bathroom or from making decisions about what happens in the kitchen and bathroom. But she says, it's okay, you can stay in your room, this tiny space that would be the equivalent of what's, uh, you know, what constitutes our reserves today. Um, you know, that no longer honors that spirit of sharing and reciprocity and an agreement to work together. Um, and so I always, you know, try and work through that as, as an example. And uh, young people come up with their own brilliant solutions to how to remedy the problem that uh, I'm just posing. And 
good instructions on, you know, whoever Lucy was embodying on how to act better. <laughs> they do have some very good, very good ideas. Does that story, like, what do you think of that? Do you think it's helpful in terms of understanding treaties? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, because sharing, you know, is, is a very, it, it's a very uh, complex concept in many ways. It doesn't always mean giving everything that you have or taking nothing, right? It's, in co it's about a conversation and a relationship and being aware of what other people are experiencing. I think you're a very empathetic person, Lucy, and I often learn from the way that, that you think about what's happening to others when you're making decisions even if you make a decision for yourself that you've considered others in that. I really admire that. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, so this question is somewhat related, uh, taking a more nature-oriented approach. It's from a grade two virtual teacher, and uh, they're about to embark on exploring the Ontario curriculum on water and air, which lacks this wonderful approach and perspective. Uh, they were wondering if uh, you, Emma, or Lucy, have ideas of how they can use your book or other resources or approaches to co-learn with their students about the treaty, particularly given that so many of the students are quite disconnected from nature. Well, one of the things that um, I ask all of my students to do is to explain to me what their relationship is with and to water. Um, and it's, it's a very open-ended question. So they can choose how they want to respond to that, what body of water they're related to. And everybody has some kind of connection to water. We all have come from water. So at the very base, if someone had never interacted with any water in their lifetime, they came from water, they drink water every day, 70% of their body is made up with, of water. <laughs> so I think that there's right there, you know that there's some kind of relationship, right? Um, and the character in this book, you know, chooses her own environment. She doesn't go off on any grand adventures. And often we see that in children's books, you know, some that there's a child that goes away to discover something. And basically what this character does is she stays right at home to learn. And I think that that's an important message for young people is you can have these relationships in whatever environment you're in. So even in the city of Toronto, Toronto's built around rivers that are coming to flow into the lake that are rivers that are covered up, right? And teachers can learn about the history of those rivers that were covered in soil to make way for the city of Toronto um, and, and try and unpack what those ongoing relationships are and what the impact is on different, um, on different waterways. One of the reasons that the girl in the book doesn't have a name is that she is everyone. She's each young person that will read this book that should be able to see themselves in it um, and think about how they can uh, engage with water and, and come to um, their natural environment, wherever that may be, and try and appreciate those different parts of connections uh, of creation and see how they're connected to uh, one another. Um, Lucy, do you have any thoughts on how uh, some of the ideas in the book could be shared with students or maybe how you could take this outdoors in some ways? Um, not really, but I have something to add. Um, as for the characters, mm -hmm. Nishonis means grandfather in Anishinaabe. So what that character is practically our ancestors. And yeah. <laughs> yeah. So thinking about, I think too, you know, who are the people around us who, who are the ones who've left us some of this, uh, this knowledge, regardless of what your, your background uh, is, you know, there, there are people who left things for you and thinking about what we'll leave for our next generations, right? In, in our acts, we have, we should have them in mind. Um, and we should also think about the impacts, positive and negative, of the things that we do in our environment currently. Um, yeah, I think that there are a lot of ways to unpack the layers of this book. And I hope that that conversation will take place in a variety of different spaces and that teachers will have their own brilliant ideas um, about how to, how to bring these, these ideas into conversation in their classrooms. And I'd love to hear them. So please, please be in touch if you have 
um, if you have stories or um, or thoughts about how to share these concepts, these values more broadly. Uh, there is quite a bit of gratitude uh, for that response. So thank you kindly, I'm seeing that right now. We've also had the pleasure just simply being here at the bookstore, seeing the incredible reaction of uh, teachers and parents to the book thus far. So I have a feeling this is only a very strong start for this particular book. But your comments just now uh, did lead into the final question I'll ask you this evening as we wind up. Uh, somebody in the Q&A was curious to know how they go about getting in touch with you if they have any questions or uh, would like to follow up at all. Yeah, Is it like, best to go through you or through uh, Anik Press? You can certainly start with Anik Press um, and uh, they'll probably be quicker at responding at this time of year. I don't know if there are any other university professors that are on the call. This is crunch time. Um, and all teachers know that you have busy times of year. So uh, certainly, um, you know, fielding questions through, through any press is a great, great way to start. And um, also through the University of Ottawa website, you can find some of my contact information. And um, yeah, I, I, I think that, you know, these opportunities to connect and have these very uh, fruitful discussions are gonna take place uh, in, in many different spaces. And one of the things I was very conscious of and also so excited about is the pickup of this book in the United States. And um, one of the things that I've heard from um, American bookstores is that in terms of indigenous treaty literature for people, young people of this age group, there really is not much. And in Canada, I think that there isn't very much that's available for, for this same age group. So I'm really excited about what this might spur in terms of thoughts and actions for people of your age in the future, but also others who are going to hopefully help uh, build the resources that we have uh, along with some of the educators that are doing some great work. And I see Renee who works at the Treaty Relations Commission is, is on the call and uh, I really admire all the, the educational tools that she's helped develop over the years. And I know there are many of you doing that, um, that awesome work. So keep, keep doing it. I, uh, I think you guys are, are heroes in terms of feeding thoughts and um, creating great energy for our young people. Thank you so much. And uh, did you both have any closing words before we wind down the evening? I wanted to um, actually share a little gift. And um, from my understanding of gift giving, the, the gifts that we offer to people are for their hard work. They're for their hard work, but also a gift to the spirit. And this book definitely has a spirit. Um, and it, um, I wanted to honor the spirit of that book and of everyone who uh, was part of bringing it to life. And so I have a little blanket that is um, an important gift because it helps keep you warm and cozy. And I know that Lucy loves blankets. So this is a gift for you. I'm really honored that you came and read and sat with me tonight to share this book with um, everyone who is here. And uh, I hope that this will be a reminder of those values of reciprocity, renewal, relationship. Responsibility, responsibility <laughs> that, that are uh, that are in the book. So I wanted to uh, to do that and, and express my gratitude to Lucy and to you, John, for uh, having us here this evening. I know we probably did something different than uh, what you're normally used to in terms of authors reading from their books. But thanks for being so accommodating and uh, making the space for Lucy and I to share some of our our thoughts with you. No, of course, it was absolutely my pleasure. Thank you both so very much. I'm going to wind down the evening now, uh, express my gratitude one final time, particularly to uh, you, Emma, and to you, Lucy, for all your words of wisdom, uh, for taking the time this evening as well, and for all your thoughtful responses, for your beautiful reading and commentary, and of course, uh, for the gift of this book in particular as well, Treaty Words. Uh, it's been such a pleasure to be a part of uh, celebrating its arrival, even in such a small way. So. Thank you very much.
Thank you to Anna Press for uh, bringing this book out into the world as well. It's been a pleasure working with Stephanie and the rest of the crew there. And uh, I'd like to uh, also particularly thank all of you out in the chat, in the webinar, watching on YouTube right now, and in the future for your time and attention to this. Uh, it's been great to hear from all of you as well. And uh, thank you for creating a sense of virtual community here this evening. Even if we couldn't gather in person, this still feels like a wonderful celebration. So I hope you all have a very lovely night and uh, we'll hope to see you again. Take care and good evening. Thank you, John. Thank you.